The Oklahoma City Thunder get their summer league underway tonight. Chet Holmgren returns to the court tonight. The Thunder keep making moves. What is Sam Presti cooking? We're going to talk about all that coming up on today's Locked On Thunder podcast. You are Locked On Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your teams every day. I am your host, Rylan Styles. You can follow me on Twitter at Rylan underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunderpod. Email the show, LO Thunderpod at gmail.com. On today's show, brought to you by our good friends over at Prize Picks, we're going to dive into the Thunder starting out their summer league. A preview of who to watch for what to watch for, the roster, and what you should expect all the way around at Summer League. Plus, the Thunder keep on making moves. They've brought in Jack White. They've brought in Patty Mills. Why are they doing this? What are the Thunder cooking? I want to know, you want to know, what's going on in Oklahoma City. We'll talk about all that coming up. But let's dive into the Summer League schedule. Again, brought to you by good friends over at Prize Picks. First-time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with the promo code locked on. That's prizepicks.com, promo code locked on. The Oklahoma City Thunder Summer League schedule is a jam packed one. They're playing in two summer leagues again, which is why they're starting tonight uh, in Salt Lake City. Tonight against the Jazz at 8 p.m. on NBA TV. Wednesday against Memphis at 6 p.m. on NBA TV. Thursday, July 6th against the 76ers at 6 p.m. ESPN 2, and then they head to Vegas, and then that's whenever they play the Mavericks on the 8th on ESPN 2, the Rockets on the 11th on NBA TV, the the Pacers on the 12th on NBA TV, and the Wizards on the 14th on ESPN U, which I didn't know was still around, but I'm happy it is. So let's dive into the Thunder Summer League roster notes. The first and foremost thing to talk about is the glaring omission of 10th overall pick, Kassan Wallace. He is not on this initial roster because this initial roster is for Salt Lake City, and he is not eligible to play in Salt Lake City because the trade is not yet official. The trade cannot be made official until the 6th, and so that means that Wallace cannot play with the Thunder until the 6th. And so he'll join the team in Las Vegas, His first game, his summer league debut, will be against none other than the Dallas Mavericks. How fun is that? Lively against Kassan Wallace. Now, the majority of this Thunder summer league roster is actually like returning guys that that have played for the Thunder and have had NBA experience. Some notes on that. Jalen Williams out of Santa Clara is up to 220 pounds now. Chet Holmgren, who's on the roster, gained 13 pounds since last summer league. That's impressive for all the jokes that get made and the, and the the picture comparisons and and the jokes that follow with that to be injured for a whole year to be seven, one still gain 13 pounds is pretty good. And then Usman Jang is now listed at six ten. on this one. I will say, I think he should have always been six ten. Um, I did see him this summer at a couple of community events. I think he looks six ten, uh, for whatever that extra inch is worth, mm-hmm. but there you go. He's got it. Six ten for Usman Jang. So the current thunder league, th- thunder players on the summer league roster, Usman Jang, Chet Holmgren, Keontae Johnson, Trey Mann, Jeremiah Robinson Earl, Jalen Williams. Both of them are on the roster in this one. Kesson Wallace will be, of course, joining them in Vegas, and we'll talk about what changes in Vegas coming up. Some guys with NBA experience are Jared Butler, who was with OKC last year on a two-way deal, played for the Blue as well. He's currently a free agent. Uh, Jamias Ramsey, who spent the year with the Blue and tore it up, was, was an absolute bucket in the G League. And I, I've talked to scouts about Jamias Ramsey, and the reason he hasn't gotten another NBA shot is that they worry that the scoring isn't going to translate at the NBA level. 
Now, I say this stage is bigger for Jemias Ramsey, not in the sense of intensity or competition, but rather the, the, the fact that the decision makers are in the gym. The, the, the NBA decision makers are in the gym. They're at least going to be watching and, 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 and having a close eye on you. So that's important for Jemias Ramsey. Zaire Smith, who you'll remember, was a talented prospect. He's also in Summer League for OKC. Jaden Shackelford played for the Blue um, and was a nice three-point shooter. So we'll see what he brings. And then Taquan Plowden played for the New Orleans G League team. So he's there as well. Other players of note, Caleb McConnell out of Rutgers. He worked out for OKC. He's a really good defensive ace prospect. And I think he can earn a two-way contract with OKC with a strong summer league showing. Uh, Tanner Groves, look, he's a former Sooner, hometown connection. He's probably going to go the way of Ryan Spengler in this uh, summer league audition, but at least he's on the roster. That's pretty cool. Uh, Hunter Malnado worked out for OKC pre-draft that's on the roster. Uh, Justice Suing worked out with OKC pre-draft that is on the roster. And then KJ Williams from LSU. So again, typically you shouldn't expect any of these returners um, to play past Salt Lake City. And if they do, that's just a wonderful, um, you know, a wonderful uh, surprise. But but typically, guys like Chet, guys like Chang, guys like Trey Mann, Jeremiah Armstrong, and, and the Jalen Williamses are not going to play in Vegas. That's just the, the typical uh, traditional aspect of it. What should you be watching for, though, at Summer League? I'm glad you asked. Number one, the most important thing, is that Chet Holmgren's back on the court. It's been a long time coming. Uh, you, you watched him last summer league in this very environment in Salt Lake City, tear it up and get praised upon from Kevin Durant and other NBA stars. Uh, Patrick Beverly praised him last week about uh, how guys around the league really appreciate his mentality and appreciate um, the way that he approaches the game. Getting to watch him play again is always going to be good. It's always going to be fun. And so you get to watch Chet home run. Seven is now free. If you remember that saga from a couple months ago. But yeah, just how does Chet look in general is the biggest thing to watch. But past that, there's still a lot of intrigue. Usman Jang, I think, played up to expectation last year. And he did it while battling injury, which is impressive. Injury both in the summer league, where he had the wrist injury initially, and then had another uh, uh, wrist injury in the season, which is unrelated to his, his um, summer league injury, but still two wrist injuries. And through that, he still played the way you would expect a rookie to play in the NBA. He was a really good defender, like we thought he'd be. And then offensively, he had some flashes. The difference for Usman Jang, to me, is going to be his aggression. Can he be aggressive? Can he, can he stick his nose in it more? Can he get more involved offensively rather than just kind of floating around? And at times, even in the G League, he had, the, he had a bad habit of just floating around. But more often than not, he was a lot better in the G League than the NBA. And even in the NBA, I think he did play up to par. I think that the, that the emergence of how good J-Dub was made us think that Usman Jang was not playing good. Usman Jang was tracking exactly like we'd expected him to track. You know, if you, if you go back to what we thought would happen in October, which is what happened in April with the, with the ability of uh, seeing the full season, you would have signed off on that nine times out of 10, especially about an injury. But he does have a, a glaring thing to, to, to improve upon. And that's what makes Summer League fun, is that you're, 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 you're seriously focused on one thing. And he's going to have to look more aggressive offensively, especially in the half court. Big Summer League from Trey Mann and Jeremiah Robinson Earl. A little bit uh, surprising to see them on the Summer League roster, but they're, they're fighting for their drops, frankly. Uh, they are fighting for their drops, uh, taking it one at a time. For Trey Mann, it's just, can he hit shots? Like, we know he can get separation. We know he can break down his defender. We know that he can get quality looks, but for some reason, they just didn't fall last year. Are they going to start falling? And then you have to wonder, has his defense improved? Which I think is an, a semi-outdated concern with Trey Mann. Because I think that last year, he improved his defense dramatically. And last year, he looked more like the top-end version of himself defensively that you're going to get from Trey Mann, but, but maybe he has another gear to get to on that end. Uh, it's mainly for me, it's offensively. You've got the million dollar moves. Can you get the finish? Can you deposit the check in summer league? That's what I want to see. Can he deposit the check? With Jeremiah Robson I want to combine him with Jay will actually, 
we've seen the high highs from Jerry. We've seen the low lows. And, and that's mainly been centered around his injury with Jeremiah Robinson Earl. Where does he level off at? Like, what is he? Is he the high high or the low low or somewhere in between? And then same thing with Jay Will about leveling off. Last year was incredible. And I, and I really believe that you know, the time he spent with Cam Woods with the blue allowed him to have such success in the back half of the season. But this is a guy that did not shoot the ball well in college and then shot the ball extremely well as a rookie. Does that ebb and flow at all in summer league? Not that that is the end all be all not that that is um, either way is going to determine his future, right? Like for Jay Will specifically, if he shoots 50% from three on five attempts this summer league, it doesn't mean anything. If he shoots 0% from three on six attempts a night, it doesn't mean anything. But just getting a, getting another data point on what that's going to level out, out from beyond the arc, because I think that everything else is pretty status quo for him. Like I, I believe he's a really good playmaker for a big man. I believe that he's able to take charges at a high clip and and and, and the best charge taker in the league. I believe that that he is able to uh, box out and, and, and clear lanes for guys to go clean up rebounds. The three-point shooting stuff, though, I want to believe it. I hope I can believe it. I want to just continue to see it. I want to continue to see it. Not to say that I don't think it can happen, but I want to continue to see it uh, from Jay Will. So getting the levels of where Jerry and Trey and, and, and uh, getting the levels of where Jerry and Jay Will are is going to be important. And then for Trey Mann, can you convert? Can you just make something happen offensively? Who should you watch out for when it comes to the non-returners? We'll talk about that. Plus Sam Presti keeps making roster moves. What is he cooking? Is a big trade on the horizon? Maybe. We'll see. We'll talk about it coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now, my good friends over at Price Picks. Price Picks is awesome. And to me, it makes watching games more fun, frankly. You go to pricepicks.com or the Price Picks app. When you do, you can deposit match up to $100 with 100% deposit match up to $100 with the code locked on. That code locked on, of course, gets you that deposit match. And what Price Picks is, is the wonderful and best tool to me when watching games. It's just you versus the projected numbers. You're not competing against these other players that that study this for a living and, and literally play fantasy sports as their job. You're just playing the numbers and playing the projections. So you pick two to six players and you project, are they going to score more or less than their prize pick projections? And you can win 25 times your money on any entry. And so with that, you can take tonight. I think Chet Holmgren is going to have more then 15 and a half points. I think that Usman Jang will have more than two and a half rebounds. And if you're right, bada bing, bada boom, you're winning 25 times your money on any entry up to that amount. So check it out today. They offer other sports, NBA, NFL, NHL, PGA, college football, men and women's college basketball, soccer, WNBA, esports, NASCAR, tennis, MMA, boxing, disc golf, Euro basket, cricket, and more. Check it out today by downloading the Price Picks app or going to pricepicks.com. Whenever you go to Price Picks, you can use the code locked on for a 100% deposit match up to $100. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. So we've typed out what to watch for. I want to see Chet Holmgren play basketball. I want to see him hit a three, you know, a trailing three. I want to see him in the pick and roll. I want to see him defend the rim and with a massive shot block. I want to see it all from Chet Holmgren. For Usman Jang, I want to see him be a more aggressive offensive player. For Trey Mann, I want to see him cash those checks. If you watch Trey Mann play, as I've said before, and you stopped the clip when the ball was at its apex, you would think that he created enough separation and, and, you, and he did all the right things, breaking down his defender, the ball should go in. It doesn't go in. It doesn't go in last year. So that could just been a tough year. And I think that he is, is able to have a breakout, but you got to see it. And look, that breakout might be too little too late in Oklahoma City, but it, but it still could carry momentum for his next team. Now, this is a former first-round pick, after all, that has a lot of scoring stuff, I think, that can that can translate in the NBA somewhere, either in Oklahoma City or somewhere else. Jeremiah Rumson Earl, what is he? Like, at this point, you've got to start to make a decision. And we've seen really good stuff, really good flashes from him. We've also seen him not even look like a rotational player. And then Jay will I'm excited to see what year two looks like for Jay will So, Keontae Johnson. I think he's going to steal the hearts of OKC fans. I think he's going to do all the stuff. Like he's going to play with intensity. He's going to play with injury. 
I mean, not injury, sorry. He's going to play with intensity. He's going to play with uh, hustle. He's going to play uh, with, you know, diving on the floor. He's going to, he's going to play the passing lanes. He's going to do all the scrappy stuff that you love. He's going to have nice cuts uh, and, and, and rim rattling dunks and catch alley oops. And he's just going to be a lot of fun to watch. And I think that he's going to really open up some eyes in summer league uh, for, for a, especially the 50th overall pick. And I, and I do believe he has the juice. Like I, I think, you know, if you, if you if you go downstairs right now, you're about to start eating breakfast. You pour a glass of juice. That's how much juice Kathy Johnson has. Some guys only have a drop. Some guys have an empty carton. Full glass of juice for Kathy Johnson, uh, in my opinion. Jared Butler trying to work back on a two-way deal uh, with this showcase in Summer League. I am confident in saying that the Thunder organization really likes him. Uh, so I want to see what he can do in Summer League. Like I said, Jemias Ramsey, he's on this stage where it's not a big stage. And again, it doesn't matter. But if he does play like he's playing in the G League with every NBA decision maker out there, it could earn him something. Could earn him a training camp invite. Could earn him something uh, here uh, at this stage. And then for J-Dub, I think that J-Dub is going to be the most in, in, impressive player and best player on the floor in every single game he plays in. A lot like how Josh Giddy looked last year in year two in Summer League. That's how you're supposed to look as a guy of that stature who decides to play summer league. And I have no doubts he'll look that way. The area I would want for the thunder to explore with him would be some more ISO scoring kind of attempts, like some more, more aggression, you know, not aggression. Cause like he does have that. Whereas like Usman Jang rarely showed that, but more selfishness is, has the wrong connotation to it, but just more so being, Hey, it's, it's it's not only my turn, but I'm going to take it and uh, I'm going to get us a bucket here. He's able to do that. He's shown he can do that, but he he much more seems to prefer to play within the team construct. I, I, in this in this environment, in this setting of summer league, I'd like to see him be uh, kind of that go-to bucket getter, at least for a game or two, just to, just to kind of see what it looks like whenever he's doing that. And again, it won't mean anything, but it'd be fun. It'd be really fun. And then the last thing I'm watching for uh, in terms of, of this uh, returning group, would be Zaire Smith. Fun prospect. And there's a reason why they, they threw him uh, an invite here to, to their summer league team. What is he going to bring to the table? What is he going to bring? And then my guy, Caleb McConnell. I, I love Caleb McConnell. I, I think that he is going to be a two-way steal for someone. I'm not sure if it's going to be Oklahoma City. I hope that it is. But I think that someone out there is going to, to see what he does in summer league, see the way he plays defense, See the way he can that he can impact the team offensively as just a play finisher who plays his role and really impress teams in this summer league session in Salt Lake City and also in Vegas. So keep an eye on Caleb McConnell. I really think he could be a two-way guy, especially as the league adds the third two-way slot. There's almost no reason why. If he plays up to expectation, there's no reason why he should not have a two-way gig uh, in the NBA by the end of summer league, by the start of next season. Speaking of next season, the Thunder keep making moves. They keep making moves. We uploaded the Victor Ladipo, uh, Michich, uh, Michich episode. And then after that, boom, the Thunder go add Jack White to a two-year deal. That's a standard contract. It's not a two-way contract. It's a two-year deal. So a standard contract. I would guess, again, guess that there is a lot of language in here allowing the Thunder to get out of it, especially that second year. Like the first year could be guaranteed, whatever. The second year I would almost guarantee, but I would just, again, say guess that there is non-guaranteed language in it where they can just cut bait with uh, Jack White at any moment. I don't think that this signing ensures him a roster spot. I think it gives him an inside lane, but doesn't ensure him a roster spot. He's going to have to prove it in training camp and continue to impress it. And he can. Not like he's a 6'7", undersized power forward at 225 pounds, but he ranked in the 85th percentile in transition in the G League, the 76th percentile in, on cuts in the G League, the 91st percentile on post-ups in the G League. He ranked uh, in the 79th percentile in spot-up attempts you know, as a scorer. He shot 46% on catch-and-shoot jumpers. He shot 62% at the rim. He's a really nice play finishing six, seven, small ball four. And Josh Giddy has high praise for him. 
and will play for the Australian national team alongside Josh Getty and Patty Mills. He, he played good. I look, I, I think that he, you know, has about a quarter cup of juice. I wouldn't say it guarantees him a roster spot in OKC, but it guarantees him a shot to prove that he deserves one. And this contract is what the Thunder have been preaching about. If you listen to Sam Presti, he pretty much just tells you what he's going to do, and he does it. Even dating back to when they were stripping this team down to the studs, the Thunder have always talked about how their end goal, the end goal of all this, is to have such internal competition in training camp and in that room where guys are fighting and clawing and hoping that they can be a part of the 17, 18 guys that make it to the other side whenever you include two ways. This is part of it. You bring in guys like Jack White. You bring in guys like, we'll talk about in a second, Patty Mills. Not everyone can survive, but the best will survive and will make the team better at the end of it. And it's awesome to have a organization top to bottom, tippity top to bottom, that is committed to that and not only committed to that, but willing to, hey, we're going to sign a guy might cut him at the end of it and, and he'll never play for us, but we, we've got to give him some money here to get him in the room. Did that with Ronnie Price, did that with uh, Frank Jackson, could do this again with Jack White. There was a, there's some precedent for it, albeit not very likely, there is some precedent for it uh, in the past. And Jack White could make this roster. Like, he is good enough to make this roster, but I wouldn't sharpie it in. He's still got to go to training camp. He's still got to prove uh, what he can do. And hopefully for him, he does. That'll lead to some hard decisions for the Thunder. But you like hard decisions. If you have hard decisions, you have a good roster. If there's no hard decisions, typically you have a bad roster. Like if you don't care, right? If you get to October 10th and you do not care when the press release comes out and says who they've cut, you just don't care. It's TJ Leaf. Remember that cut? You got a bad team. You got a bad team. So it's good to have this competition. Patty Mills will play a, a part of this competition. He's been rerouted to Oklahoma City uh, from a prior deal with the Rockets and the Nets. The Thunder are going to get some draft compensation for taking on Patty Mills. He, he is a $6.8 million expiring contract. He's 34 years old. He's the third Australian on this roster. He shot 36% from beyond the arc last year. Patty Mills can be another adult in the room. I wouldn't say that he's for sure gone. I would put him on the hot seat, though. There's only a few names who aren't on the hot seat, you know, who, you know, who, 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 you know, have a shot to be cut. Because some of these names are just sharpied in with a bullet. So Patty Mills has to go on the list of, of names that could be gone by the time the season starts. But I'm interested to see how it all shakes out. Because I think you can make the case and the argument for it to go a lot of different ways. And we'll talk about what this roster looks like and who's on the hot seat coming up. But first, I want to say right now, but good friends over at the Locked on NBA podcast. A lot of stuff has happened in free agency over the last weekend. You need to get caught up. And to do that, check out Locked on NBA going to have the normal episode with Jackson Gatlin hosting and also an episode with uh, of Howard Beck um, recapping it all from the weekend that we just saw. So stay tuned for that this afternoon as well. Check it out. Great show. You can see it right there. Watch Locked in NBA. All right, we're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Folks, I got to ask the question. What is Sam cooking? What is he cooking? And while I think it's fun to envision this massive unspooling, to think that Sam Presti has this incredible bulletin where there's red yarn stringing around and, and attached from a picture of this player to that player to this player. In reality, what I think he's doing is buying second round picks. And I understand that fans might view that as like, second round picks. We see every year how valuable second round picks are specifically on the trade market. Like forgetting about the draft, 
I think people confuse like the second round picks with like the players you see draft in the second round. That's like 1% of it. We see every year how important the second round picks are to salary dump contracts, to add veterans to the trade deadline, to go get a guy who has zero leverage in his old spot, to go take a flyer on a young guy who maybe you evaluated very highly, but in the wrong situation didn't pan out. And you think that in the right situation in your locker room, they can pan out. Second round picks have value and most of their value is not on draft day. Most of their value is all the other stuff you can do with them. If the Thunder wanted to make a big splash, they could probably have just done this with their cap space, right? If they really were were, were envisioning a, a massive splash, they could have just done this by trading Lou Dort and a bunch of picks. All they've gotten is stuff. Like, no offense, but like Victor Oladipo, Jack White, Patty Mills, and Michic combined with three first-round picks, those guys are a selling point. The three first-round picks are. So if they were if they were waiting on some big trade to make with a big contract, they had Lou Dort and they had the picks who are in who are who are substantially more valuable than Oladipo, Jack White, Patty Mills, you know, these guys. But specifically with Patty Mills and Victor Oladipo and Dallas Pertons, it's buying draft picks. It's buying draft capital. Draft capital that we have seen and all agree, by the way, that with the new CBA inflates in value. And so they took on money that does not impact their ability to sign their core, does not extend to their, their, their next few seasons when they need to start signing their core guys. They took on money in the short term that they were going to have to spend anyway for a team whose track record led ESPN to pick Derek Fisher as their best free agent signing. Now we can get into if that's the right pick or not. I don't care about that. I'm saying it's not as though this organization blows it out of the water in free agency. You can't use it that way in Oklahoma City. You just can't. At least not yet. So they used it, which they had to use anyway, to acquire second round picks that we see every single year that are valuable. All the trades that, that, that are being graded as A plus and whoa, what a steal for this team. They're usually second round picks for, for a flyer on a guy or second round picks for a veteran uh, on, on, on a contract or second round picks of the trade deadline. So like the second round picks are valuable. And they're, and, and they're valuable whenever you had to spend the money anyway. And so that leads us to the next conversation. Well, what's going on? What's going on in Bricktown? You know, you got 20 players on the roster. 19 of them are on standard contracts. You got to cut four players because, again, Kenley Johnson is on a two-way deal, so he does not count against the cuts. You got to cut four players. And then there's the joke of, like, do the Thunder have too many guards? It's a good joke. It's a great joke, even. And you know my feelings on this from the Draft Night podcast. But at the end of the day, they've technically added guards. They've added Penny Mills. They've added Victor Oladipo. But they're going to get cut. Like, they're not going to keep all these guys. Four guys have to get cut. If the Think about this, folks. Now, look. I'm uh, Hand up. Circle of trust right now. Circle of trust. This does not leave this podcast, okay? If you're listening to this, this does not leave this room. Circle of trust, I'm terrible at math. In fact, I am I am what would be defined in my day as god-awful at math, okay? But I know if you say that this roster is overwhelmed with guards and that the Thunder have to cut four players, if there's an overwhelming number that has to be subtracted by four, the odds are some of these four, if not the majority of this four, are going to be guards, Gonna be guards, folks. The Thunder have to cut four players on a roster that you think is consistent upon 20 guards. They've got to cut four of them. So the odds are they're gonna cut two, three, or even four guards. How about that? Does that answer your question of if there's too many guards? I think it does. So I don't think that anything is cooking. Now, when you think that, Sam Presti typically surprises you. But I don't think anything's cooking because they could have just made a big splash. In, in a trade, absorbing contracts into their salary cap that they already had, plus trading the Dort contract and even the Bretons contract that they acquired on draft night. So I don't think that acquiring Victor Oladipo's contract or Patty Mills's contract plays a role in all this. I think acquiring those contracts were just simply acquiring second round picks that are that are very valuable. And so you roll into October, and on October thirteenth, that 
eleven forty six p.m. Central Standard Time. We'll get an email from the Thunder PR department, and they'll say who the Thunder have cut, and they'll cut four guys. And I'll put it on Twitter. People have a uh, all-out battle in the comments, and we move. That's what I think is cooking. That's what I think is cooking. What's actually cooking is Summer League, up and running, in Salt Lake City, tonight. You got to watch it. I'm going to watch it. We're going to recap it tomorrow. I want to say one last disclaimer. I understand Summer League doesn't matter. I talk about this team every single day. We're going to treat it like it matters. We're going to recap the game like it was a real game. So be prepared for that emotionally. I know that that's really hard uh, for some people who just cannot resist the urge to tell me Summer League doesn't matter. We know. Okay. Until tomorrow, you know what I'm going to say, folks. Be good and be good to one another.